All right. Uh, hello. Thank you for coming uh, to my talk. Today we will be talking about Apache Giraffe. Uh, and this will be a presentation, you know, which is a combination of sort of graph processing and big data. Um, a lot of times, you know, you can actually do very interesting things with small graphs, but, you know, Giraffe is particularly good when you actually have sort of big data in mind. So before I actually start talking about Giraffe itself, let me just introduce myself. Uh, so this is me. Uh, I've been at ASF, you know, for quite some time, so doing, you know, various things. Used to be at Cloudera uh, doing Hadoop, you know, before that uh, at Yahoo. And I actually have two pitches, you know, so I'll just get them out of the way and <laughs> we will continue with the presentation. So I am also one of the three authors in the, you know, upcoming book uh, called Giraffe in Action uh, from Manning. Uh, so, you know, support hungry authors, you know, buy our book. That's pitch number one. Uh, and pitch number two, I'm working for the company called Pivotal. We're a pretty uh, interesting startup company, you know, doing uh, big data and platform as a service things. And I'm really hiring, so I'm actually building a team of people who can help me uh, figuring out next generation platform. Uh, so, yeah, if you're interested, you know, catch me after the presentation. And that was my second pitch. So let's actually get right to the giraffe business. Uh, so in this uh, presentation, I will actually try to talk a little bit about, you know, where it all came from and sort of background of, you know, Hadoop and big data processing, how it relates to graphs, uh, how, you know, graph workloads actually tend to be different compared to MapReduce. Uh, we'll introduce this thing called bulk synchronous uh, parallel. Uh, you know, for those of you who don't know it, you know, it'll be a primer on what it is. And then we will talk about, you know, how Giraffe implements it. And I will also try to show you code, you know, samples. Uh, so my real goal that at the end of this presentation, you can actually start writing your graph processing applications on top of Giraffe, because it's really quite simple. So let's get down to business. Uh, as all you know, of us know, uh, Doug Cutting was the original implementer of uh, Hadoop. Hadoop consisted of HDFS and MapReduce, but Hadoop really came uh, from Google Papers. So what Doug did, he basically read two papers, one on GFS, you know, Google File System, uh, and another one on MapReduce, and he implemented uh, both uh, in the free and open source uh, Java-based uh, Hadoop thing. So if you think about, you know, where GFS and MapReduce sort of what kind of uh, constraints or what kind of, you know, use cases uh, they were aiming uh, to solve at Google, uh, GFS was really meant to be, you know, fully highly distributed, so it's kind of like scale-out storage. Uh, it was meant to be replicated because, you know, it was, again, meant to run on the commodity hardware, which fails all the time. Uh, and in order to achieve the first two, they basically had to make a compromise by not making, uh, by not making it a POSIX file system. So GFS actually happens to be a non-POSIX file system. Uh, one of the biggest limitations in uh, GFS, and you know, hence HDFS, you cannot really, for example, seek in a file and then write. You, know, you can only keep writing to a file. You know, maybe you can keep appending, depending on the version of Hadoop. Uh, but most of the time, your data is you know, sort of write and then read multiple times. And read is actually optimized for streaming. So if you're trying to seek in the file all the time, again, not a good idea. Uh, streaming and you know, scale out is what GFS and HDFS are really uh, good at. Uh, on top of uh, the file system, Google and you know, Hadoop, uh, by extension, implemented a compute framework called MapReduce. Uh, with the big insight that, you know, you don't really have to get your data to where the computation is, you know, if your computation is portable, and that was part of the reason, you know, Hadoop was actually implemented in Java, you can actually push your computation to where your data is, because, you know, with Java, it doesn't really matter, you know, where you compute, as long as there is a JVM on that node. So MapReduce was meant to be distributed. It was also meant to be batch-oriented in a sense that you would actually expect your jobs to take a long time and produce sort of a final result. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, the algorithm that you would run on MapReduce, by and large, tend to be embarrassingly parallel. So you can share the computation as wide as possible, and it is only during the reduce phase where you would actually combine, you know, some of the results from different uh, computational units. So as you can see, I mean, there are quite a few limitations, but amazingly enough, uh, the MapReduce has been a really successful framework, so there is all sorts of you know, computational paradigms that map into it well. Unfortunately, graph processing is just not one of them. <laughs> so uh, one size really doesn't fit all. Um, in MapReduce, you, know, you have this key value approach, so map, 
is how we get the keys. So you extract the keys from the data, and that's the math phase. Uh, then there is a shuffle phase, essentially, you know, sorting the keys. And the reduce phase is, you know, a single bit of code gets to see all of the values corresponding to a single key in one go. So that's, you know, the reduce phase. Uh, but in graphs, it's not really even clear what would be, you know, a natural sort of key, you know, well, I guess you can come up with some, but it doesn't really lend itself easily to that type of uh, processing. Uh, so MapReduce also has this idea of a pipelining in a sense that once a phase of map reducing, you know, map, shuffle, reduce is done, the only place where you would store result is in HDFS. All of the, you know, very at times complex memory states that you've created by, you know, for doing all these three phases is now gone. So if you actually have, you know, multi-staged MapReduce job, you basically will keep going in and out of HDFS all the time for intermediate results, which is a little bit like, you know, imagine if Unix didn't have pipes, right? You know, you would basically have to create, you know, temporary files all the time, you know, not really uh, efficient. And especially if you create, again, non-trivial memory state, you know, not really a good idea. And again, MapReduce is a very particular API for working with your data. Uh, there have been the, a couple of attempts to actually map uh, graph processing into MapReduce. The craziest attempt I've seen was at Facebook. Uh, so before Giraffe existed, at Facebook, they actually needed to you know, analyze the social graph. And the only thing they had was Hive. So Hive is a SQL on top of Hadoop. So there was this really smart dude who used to do C++ uh, who came up with this idea that you know, literally all graph processing could be mapped into a linear algebra. You, know, you could basically uh, do pretty much anything using you know, adjacency metrics and you know, operations on the adjacency metrics. But what he came up with then was he could actually map linear algebra into SQL you know, in a very, very convoluted way, but it worked. And you know, the kind of SQL that he showed me which is like, I haven't seen that type of SQL you know, being produced by like, you know, uh, Hibernate. You know, it's really mind-boggling. But apparently it works. So they actually started analyzing their social graph way back when, before Giraffe using Hive. Uh, but of course, you know, Giraffe is a much more natural fit. So uh, let's actually talk a little bit about you know, why is it different with graphs compared to the, your typical big data use case. Uh, so, when you store unstructured data in HDFS, and that's what you know, it's really all about, uh, you talk about tuples, right? And these tuples are essentially you know, points in a, some kind of a space, you know, solution typically space. And it can describe, you know, those tuples can describe your customer data, your product data, your interaction data. But when you start talking graphs, what you're really doing, you're basically coming up with connection between those tuples. And two things happen. First of all, unlike in most traditional uh, graph databases, you actually do just that, you come up with those connections. Up front, you might not even know that you know, two tuples might necessarily be connected by some kind of an edge. It may actually be a knowledge that you somehow you know, derive later on by the time that all of the data is stored in your uh, HDFS. And as we all know, you know, big data is all about sort of growth, but if your data size grows linearly, your connection sort of uh, edge you know, number actually grows exponentially. So even storing all of the edges would not be a good idea. You actually have to come up with what the edges are you know, most of the time sort of on the fly. And that's what really, to me, is different about applying graph processing techniques to big data, right? You, know, you don't actually upfront know what the connections are. You actually extract them so, sort of based on some kind of a you know, model. And it may very well be that you know, one run on the same data will actually come up with one set of edges, and a different run on the very same set of data would come up with a different set of edges. And a good example of that would be, you know, suppose you're trying to match customers to products, right? So you might actually have a social graph of your customers, and that's just fine. You're essentially connecting all the tuples you know, between the customers. But then, you know, the next iteration could be, you could actually be matching customers to the products, and then you know, the very sort of same data set would produce you know, different graphs. So what kind of challenges do we actually have while doing it? Well, again, data is dynamic, so there's no way of doing sort of scheme on right. Uh, the algorithms that we tend to run, again, tend to be explorative and iterative. Like I said, I mean, you might actually load up the data, you know, come up with one set of you know, edges, but then all of a sudden, like, oh man, I actually need a different set of edges. And it would be really wasteful if you actually had to reload all of the data, you know, just like MapReduce uh, makes you do. Uh, so we have to do something else. Uh, and you, know, you can actually use Graph Database, which is one of the things that, you know, I believe there's a few 
uh, talks uh, in this uh, track. And, you know, they're good in the sense that I haven't really used them that much, but, you know, my friends tell me that, you know, if you really need Neo4j, you know where to get it, where, to, you know, it's, it's available. Uh, there are benefits, uh, you know, to me, the biggest benefit is that it's a self-contained system, right? You know, if you install it, if you maintain it, I mean, it kind of gives you what you need, right? Uh, but the shortcoming is it is a self-contained system. So, like, the internal state of that system can only be gotten, you know, from calling the APIs that that system provides. So, unlike what Giraffe is doing, where it basically just looks at your unstructured data, whatever the data is, you actually have to feed the data into the uh, graph database first, and only then you can work with it. But again, the flip side is, you know, it's highly optimized for that type of workload, so there is all sorts of interesting things that they do. Uh, it really depends on your use case. Uh, if you can define a schema for your uh, graph upfront, I mean, there's no reason not to try, you know, something like this. But if your schema is not actually definable, Giraffe is pretty much the only game in town for now. Actually, it's not. I mean, there is also a project called Apache Hama, uh, but I'm not sure how active it is. Uh, it used to be pretty active, but now that Facebook invested in uh, Giraffe, uh, basically there's a few engineers just full-time, you know, optimizing and working on it. I think Giraffe is way ahead of, you know, most of the graph processing tools on top of Hadoop. Uh, so key insights that Giraffe brought uh, to this problem is, well, let's keep a state in memory for as long as we actually need it. So there is absolutely no reason to throw away that state, you know, that, you know, what MapReduce does. We can actually keep it in memory. And that makes it interesting from the implementation side because Giraffe actually happens to be the first framework uh, that can leverage this next generation Hadoop uh, scheduling and, you know, provisioning capability called Yarn. Uh, where it's not really about fitting everything into MapReduce, you actually ha can have different frameworks running on top of the very same Hadoop. So MapReduce just being one of them, Giraffe would be a different framework. Uh, we are leveraging HDFS, as I said, you know, as a repository for unstructured data, but the biggest sort of insight is how do we actually do the computation? And that's, you know, BSP. So what's BSP? BSP stands for Bulk Synchronous Parallel, and it's really a very simple idea of how you can achieve a middle ground between something as restrictive as MapReduce, where there's absolutely, you know, few points of communicating any kind of data between, you know, workers. Again, if you think about it, I mean, the only two points where communication happens is once mappers are done, you know, the data needs to be sorted. That's the only, you know, one point of communication. And once the data is sorted, that data needs to be streamed to uh, reducers, and that's the only other point of communication. So suppose we want, you know, to have workers uh, be able to communicate with each other. So a different extreme would be to let them communicate absolutely freely. You know, at any time, anything can send a message to anything else. And the only thing that you are waiting in such a system is, you know, a bunch of deadlocks. Um, you know, those of you who have done MPI know what I'm talking about. Uh, so what's the middle ground? Well, bulk synchro synchronous parallel, you know, BSP offers the middle ground where you actually partition your communication and computation phases, basically separating them by, by barriers. So you have as many local processing, you know, within the units done as possible. But once all of that processing is done, that's when you hit barrier uh, number two, right? So barrier number one is when everything starts computing. Barrier number two is when everything is done doing the local computation. And between barrier number two and barrier number three, there is an absolutely unrestricted communication happening, you know, essentially messages sent. But there is no computation happening at all. So the computation will start happening once all of the messages get delivered. And the computation will take into account the messages that were delivered to the local state. But while the communication is in flight, no computation is happening. So you basically have this, you know, kind of like Kachangin states, right? You know, you do computation, then messages, then computation, then messages, then computation, then messages. And it actually happens to be a rather nice uh, model for graph processing. So let's actually try to apply it to graphs. So this is an example graph of my Twitter, you know, network. Uh, so my Twitter handle is Erhutter, uh, and I'm following, you know, Apache Software Foundation, obviously. So there is a friend of mine, uh, Constantine, who I, you know, we both follow each other. And he also is, you know, following ASF, but ASF is not following anybody. So uh, with BSP applied to graphs, you know, at every given vertex is where you have your local computational sort of power, right? You know, you actually have to think like a vertex. So what does a vertex think? Well, vertex 
knows and thinks, you know, it's local state. It basically has control over any kind of, you know, local state and memory it can create. It just happens to be a Java thread, right? Uh, it knows its neighbors. So the Vertex knows, you know, who, who the Vertex is connected to, and it can traverse the network of the neighbors, but it does not necessarily know who is connected to the Vertex. So you can basically get all of the outgoing edges, but you don't know incoming edges. So Vertex can also send a message to just about anything you know, uh, within the network. So there does not need to be a connection for a message to arrive from point A to point B. You can just send arbitrary messages. Uh, Vertex can declare that it's done. And amazingly enough, Vertex can actually mutate the graph topology. So it would not be out of the question to start with absolutely no vertices and just build out the complete graph in memory, you know, based on certain criteria, because you know a single vertex can just build you know portions of the graph. Uh, that topology is considered to be sort of most of the time, at least, is considered to be kind of like messaging. So it will be available to the workers, you know, for the next step. So they will not start computing immediately. So these uh, five points is the full Giraffe uh, sort of API right there. Uh, basically, BSP happens, like I said, at the level of individual vertices. Then there is a bunch of you know, message delivery, uh, and it keeps, keeps going on. So without further ado, uh, here's the first, you know, Giraffe Hello World. So what this little snippet of code does, well, first of all, it shows that Java makes you write tons of boilerplate, but, you know, we'll get to it in a minute. Uh, but, you know, the uh, real bit happens right here. So we basically uh, have extended the uh, basic computation uh, abstract class, uh, which is an ent entry point into writing anything in Giraffe, you know. Um, and the only method that we actually have to redefine to make it work is compute. So compute is what happens at the uh, level of each individual vertex. So within compute, like I said, I mean, we can do, I don't know, print LN, so we can print the, our ID, you know, who we are, and then we can iterate over all of the edges, you know, that are outgoing edges from this vertex, you know, printing the IDs of the neighbors we're connected to. So this is basically the smallest, I guess, you know, thing that you can do with Giraffe, pretty simple. Um, actually, it did get cut out, so at the end there is also a halting state, uh, so hopefully on the uh, further slides it will not get uh, cut out. Uh, so all of these variables, all of these type variables that you actually had to write, they're very important and they define, you know, this sort of mighty four of Giraffe APIs. So first of all, you basically have to declare a type of what is the vertex ID. So vertex ID is what you use to actually reference the vertex. If you're trying to send the message, for example, or if you're trying to connect, you know, yourself or some other vertex you actually have to know Vertex ID. This is how you reference them. Then Vertex actually happens to have the data, you know, piece of data associated with it, and that's the second type variable. Uh, then you have to define what is the piece of data associated with each edge, uh, third one. And uh, fourth one, what is the type of message that vertices will be sending to each other? So, you know, four altogether. Now, of course, if you, don't, if you are not interested in, you know, some subset of these APIs, you can just, def you know, declare it null writable. And speaking of writables, the only thing that in this that needs to be something other than just writable is the first one, vertex ID. So it also needs to be comparable. Uh, why? Because you basically, your graph gets partitioned based on vertex IDs. And the vertices get assigned to uh, workers within your uh, Giraffe application based on the uh, partitioning that happens at the level of the first type variable. Um, so let's actually take a step back. And again, like I showed you a bit of code, but like what, what is the input for that bit of code? So where do edges and you know, uh, vertices come from? when you actually start your Giraffe application. Well, like I said, I mean, you don't actually even have to define graph up front uh, because you can actually build it in memory. So you can, you know, your first sort of super step, you know, your first uh, BSP step could be you just invent the graph, right? You know, based on some criteria or whatever, you just build it in memory, and the next one, the next step will have that topology as the working topology of the graph. So that's one, but it's not really particularly interesting. Uh, what's really interesting is, you know, how you can extract the vertex and edge information from the raw data that you have in your HDFS. And for that, you know, Giraffe follows a very Hadoop-like approach. Uh, so it defines edge input format and vertex input format. You know, there is a built-in 
support for most of the storage subsystems that happen to be available on Hadoop. So there is obviously one for HDFS, there is one for HBase and Accumulo, there is a you know, backend for Gora, uh, Hive H catalog, you know, all the usual bits and pieces of the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, but you can write your own. I mean, that's, that's, that's absolutely possible. So, I mean, I know that somebody wrote one for Cassandra, and that's just fine. So the way it actually happens is, uh, suppose you have you know, some data in HDFS, and for our simple example, the type of data that I decided to use uh, and the type of input format uh, that I decided to specify is essentially an adjacency matrix, you know, just encoding the first uh, integer here is the vertex ID, and all the integers following it are the vertex IDs of the neighbors uh, for this guy. Uh, so suppose you have two files in HDFS, you know, one looking like this and the other one looking like that. You give it to Giraffe uh, when you start it up. Uh, input format kicks in. Input format builds the graph topology. Based on the vertex ID, that graph topology gets partitioned between different workers. You know, the workers get assigned to different nodes. Um, bunch of computation happens up until a point where we don't have any messages left to be processed. Uh, if we don't, and if all of the vertices voted to halt, so you know they are not doing any computation, the entire uh, giraffe application exits. And if you specify output format, at that point you can actually have your state of the graph, re you know, uh, being flushed back into whatever storage you decide to use. What's interesting is you don't actually have to use you know, the same storage. So in my example, I'm taking data from HDFS and I'm putting data back into HDFS. But this could have been HBase, and that is you know, fine to be HDFS, so you can have any combinations. So what really is, what, what, what really is happening, you have some kind of you know, storage, you have some kind of storage for output, and these little guys, they actually happen to be either Yarn containers, uh, you know, this is next generation Hadoop, uh, Hadoop 2, or uh, the hack that Giraffe uses to run on just pure Hadoop is uh, those can be map-only jobs. So, if, you know, here's a cool pro tip of how you can abuse Hadoop. You don't actually have to generate any keys, you know, in your mapper, you can just sit there, right? And that's essentially what Giraffe does. Uh, so it sits forever, and for as long as it does it, you know, Hadoop is happy because, like, you know, something is running. Um, before we move along, let's us again just recap, you know, what is the vertex view? So the vertex view is rather simple. Messages come in, messages come out, and by the way, the message data, you know, for an interest of full disclosure, could have different types for incoming and outgoing messages. There are very few really obscure use cases where it's useful. So for all of the practical purposes, you can just assume that, you know, message data one type and message data two type are the same. But other than that, again, you have vertex data associated with your vertex, you have vertex ID, and you have outgoing uh, sort of arrows, you know, edge, each labeled with edge data. So for our next example, uh, I think I have a little bit of time left. So for our next example, let us actually do something interesting. So we all know that the only difference between Twitter and Facebook is that one uses, uh, you know, directional graphs and the other one doesn't. Uh, but it's pretty easy to turn one into the other. And it's actually a necessary operation because Giraffe, by default, supports directional graphs, right? So if you want to simulate a, you know, something else, you can just build additional edges uh, you know, into your graph, and that's exactly what we will be doing here. So again, uh, here's you know, uh, compute that we are redefining, you know, the same way we did for Hello World. Uh, first of all, this is a very common pattern in Giraffe application, first of all, we try to see what is the number of the super step. Super step is that block you know, of BSP processing, and every single block gets numbered, starting from zero all the way till you know, application exits. Uh, so if we happen to be just starting, so you know, the super step equals zero, what we do is we send messages to all the edges uh, that we have, thus notifying them that we are connected to, uh, to them, right? Because as I said, we do know all of our neighbors, but neighbors do not know that we are connected to them. So if we want to build back reference, you know, sort of back edge into the graph, we actually have to notify the neighbor that we are connected to them. And once this is done, we basically vote to halt, but because there are messages in the queue, the application doesn't exit, so we go to the super step one. So super step one basically happens over here. So we get all of the messages that were sent to us from previous super step zero. Uh, 
we iterate all of uh, those messages, and what those messages tell us is who is connected to us. So the only thing that we need to do is we need to build an edge, you know, vertex at the edge, to be connected back to that guy. So essentially, you know, if you take this node, what it will do, it will send the uh, notifications to this one and this one, and the, in the next super step, you know, those guys will kick in, they will process the messages, and we'll build the back reference, you know. Uh, so that's pretty simple. Running Giraffe is actually pretty simple, but before, but it, it's a little bit time consuming, so let me actually, um, let me actually show you uh, what I will be doing here. So the only thing that you would need to do is you would need to set up environments. Um, and here I basically have Hadoop. You know, I just downloaded it from you know uh, Apache website. You know, downloaded Giraffe release. Uh, you know, this is interesting because not a lot of people realize that you can actually run Hadoop without any kind of cluster or anything running at all. So there is a mode in Hadoop called local mode where everything happens within the same JVM. It's kind of the same processing, but you're limited to just one single mapper, uh, well, one single reducer for that matter. Uh, but Giraffe doesn't care because you know, we can just like, map everything into the single uh, processing unit. Uh, an interesting way of configuring it is to point Hadoop Convdor at the empty subdirectory, which happens to be this guy. Uh, because by default, local mode is what Hadoop does. It's only when you actually configure it to do something else, it will do something else. But by default, it does local mode. So with that bit of configuration in place, uh, the way you would actually execute Giraffe is something like this. And I will go over you know, what every single line uh, in here means and does. But for now, let's just, uh, let's just start it. So as you can see, you know, Hadoop kicked in, and unfortunately, this process will take a little bit longer than you know, I might like, and I will tell you how to avoid this uh, in a minute. So let's get back to slides. Um, so yeah, Apache Hadoop 1.2 uh, is what I'm using, you know, Apache Giraffe uh, 1.1. I'm actually a release manager for this release, so like hopefully we will push it out soon, so it will be a released artifact. But for now, I really highly recommend using the snapshot, you know, the previous release of Giraffe is good, but this one had tender loving care from Facebook, so it really is better than you know, what we had in 1.0. Uh, Apache Maven is the build system you know, for Giraffe, so if you want to tinker with it, you know, Maven is highly recommended. And this is a subtle point. So Giraffe actually requires JDK 7. Um, well, maybe we will change that for this release, but at least it used to. Um, and what it really means is that if you actually have a fully distributed cluster, you actually have to run GDK7 on all of the nodes, right? So Giraffe, you know, being a MapReduce application, actually would be executed within the same JVM that you are running all over your cluster. And if that JVM happens to be JDK, you know, JVM6, it will not work. So like I said, you know, th just downloading things and you know, setting environment variables is all you need to do to actually kick, kick start it. Uh, if you're using Maven and if you're just developing your project, I mean, the only dependency that you have to declare is on Giraffe Core and on Hadoop Core. That'll, that'll get you going right away. And uh, here's how I ran it. So basically, Giraffe is a command line utility. You give it the jar file you know, that contains the code that you've developed. You give it the name of the class that has the compute method that you want to execute on your graph. Uh, you give it an input path in whatever file system is configured. And again, an interesting aspect of HDFS is that HDFS doesn't really have to be HDFS, right? You know, Hadoop can actually work with your local file system just fine. That's what I'm using here. Uh, a local sort of mode of Hadoop would be absolutely fine to just use your local files. Uh, but this is essentially, you know, path to all of my, uh, all of my files. Uh, this is the input format that I'm specifying. And unfortunately, this is the bit where Giraffe gets you know, kind of clunky, because this input format has actually, it has to match the code, you know, this four type variable that you, know, you put in your code. And if you mess it up here, it will not give you a helpful message, message it will just fail, so you know, be careful. Uh, but this input format you know, produces the edges and you know, nodes and exactly the types that we've encoded. So this is, this is an interesting bit. You, know, you, have to, you have to specify that the number of workers is one, because that's all we get in local mode. But you can specify as many workers as you want. So you know, typically, if you have a big Hadoop cluster, 
Well, I guess this is better now. Um, you can specify, you know, typically like, you know, slightly less than the total number of nodes if you want to fully utilize, utilize your cluster. So this is your responsibility. Sheriff will not figure out how many workers you want in this, you know, distributed network to be uh, instantiated. Uh, and these are settings for Giraffe itself. So this is the only really useful one. Uh, Giraffe split master worker, we're setting it to false. Uh, again, because we are running in the Hadoop local mode, we only ever get a single mapper. So we cannot really split different functionality because Giraffe has you know, different services. We actually have to run everything in a single mapper. And off you go. That's pretty much it. Uh, Again, the troubling bit is that you know I started it some time ago, but it's still going on. So it like it takes you know up to a minute or two even on the local data, which is a really tiny data set. And the reason for that is much more about Hadoop than Giraffe. Uh, so hopefully we will you know change some of it. Uh, but the best way to be as productive as possible developing on Giraffe is actually goes back to how you would unit test your application. You know your Giraffe application. And in Giraffe, if you uh, write something like this uh, and you will use internal Vertex Runner, what it will do, it will basically run the same code on essentially a mocked environment, right? So you will give the graph seed, which is an uh, array of strings, uh, you know, simulating your input data. Uh, you will expect you know, iterable uh, essential of strings that will be the simulation of your output data. Uh, and you can configure Giraffe you know, however you want, you know, just like I did on the command line, using the configuration object. So if you have this bit of code as your, you know, let's say, unit test, right? you, know, you can totally step through it you know, in your ID. You don't actually have to bootstrap anything you know, from Hadoop. You know, it's a really easy way of how you can like, just really start you know, developing on Giraffe. But of course, you know, when it's time to actually execute it on Hadoop, you will still go through the same set of steps. That hopefully finished by now. No, it's not. Well, this is this is really taking a long time, um, and I think I'm actually out of time, so I will not cover some of the more, you know, advanced use cases. Um, yeah. So yeah. So what, what what it's really doing, and again, like I'm saying, I mean, it has way more to do with Hadoop than with Giraffe. So like, if you look into it. It's basically copying the jar files uh, into the uh, uh, distributed cache. And of course, you know, in the local mode, it has absolutely no business doing it because you know, everything is available on my local machine anyway. Uh, and because, again, you know, for real Hadoop deployments, this step doesn't really have to be all that performant. You know, nobody really you know, looked into you know, optimizing it. So I think they are reading like byte by byte you know, each jar file or something. You know. <laughs> Uh, so again, it's just Hadoop copying a bunch of data from point A to point B without absolutely any need, you know, whatsoever for doing it. Uh, so, but you know, once it's done, the Giraffe application will basically kick in, will print, you know, a bunch of messages. So you know, the whole point is just to demonstrate how you could actually run it on your laptop. And if you're interested in, you know, making Hadoop nicer in this setup, you know, well, help us, you know, send patches. Uh, so yeah, questions. Okay. Hello. Okay. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I think over there. Okay. Yeah, actually, I didn't quite get how do you collect data uh, from the compute method, because you you showed how you send messages, but how do you finally collect them to HDFS or to whatever? Mm. Yeah, that's that's this one. Uh, the, this slide. Let me show it to you again. So basically, uh, yeah. just a second. Yes. So this is this step, and it's actually optional. Uh, it may very well be the case that you are absolutely not interested in the state of the graph at the end of the, uh, it, you know, at the end of the entire run. You may be looking for uh, maximum value of some kind, right? So maybe the whole point of your graph processing is to find you know, some local maximum. And once you've done it, like, that's the output of your job. So like, there's absolutely no need to actually output anything that has to do with your graph. Uh, but you can do that. Uh, and that's how you get the data out of the Giraffe application. And how would you collect the maximum then? 
Uh, that's actually the slides that I had to skip. Uh, so Giraffe has the notion of aggregators. So it's kind of like think of it as a global variable that you can keep uh, throughout the run. And the state of that global variable can be output just like, you know, uh, at any random point. And in fact, uh, what you could also do if you're actually doing, you know, a bit of uh, heuristic, you can actually look at it and say like, well, maybe it's not, you know, the optimal one, but it's good enough, so I'm quitting the entire application because it basically fits into some kind of, uh, you know, range. Uh, so you can output it, and on top of that, you can even quit the entire application at that point. And maybe the last question, what happens if uh, the no didn't vote to halt, and, but it doesn't receive any messages later on? It keeps running, essentially. Oh, yes, yeah, so the method will be called anyway. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So with the BSP model, right, mm -hmm. your super step is only as fast as the slowest uh, task within that super step. How does Giraffe determine um, how to split the individual tasks so that they complete at roughly the same time? Yeah, so uh, like I said, there is a partitioning based on the, uh, initially based on the vertex uh, uh, ID. Uh, so the partitioner is pluggable. Uh, so the default one is just, you know, hash based, you know, pretty simple. Uh, you, can, you can write your own implementation and, you know, you can partition based on any criteria. Uh, Giraffe actually does rebalance. So that's what you have to keep in mind. So if you look uh, at... Uh, da -da 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 -da. So the fact that these guys get assigned, you know, like this for one super step doesn't mean that they have to keep, you know, being assigned, you know, like this for the next super step. Before Giraffe transitions to the next super step, it actually does rebalancing, you know, based on whatever criteria you can build in. Uh, and if you, you know, start detecting that, you know, you have some slow pokes in your execution, you can notify the, uh, you know, rebalancer through your partitioning scheme that, you know, repartitioning is necessary. Okay. Any more questions? Closer? Further? Yeah. Right yeah. Hi. So, somewhere early in your slide, uh, you had a slide about um, uh, graph databases. Um, yes. Uh, isn't it a bit of a uh, um, um, strange comparison because graph databases are to store graphs and uh, no, not uh, too. And this is to process graphs. So, not for uh, uh, just to give an example, to uh, uh, to find uh, all incoming edges for a node, so in L in L for J, it's it's a millisecond operation. Whereas in in Giraffe, you'll have to actually go through all the nodes to run all this the things. So, isn't it a bit like uh, uh, PHP in MySQL? What is better? There is. It's not. Uh, the graph database is to store graphs, and this framework is to process graph on large scale. Well, I mean, if the only thing that graph databases did was, you know, they would basically let you store and retrieve the node, then I would agree with you, right? You know, but no, it actually, uh, it actually, and execute the queries. Right, it actually lets you do the queries. So once you start doing the queries, I mean, it's processing, right? It's kind of like you know saying SQL is not Turing complete. Well. It probably isn't, but it still doesn't prevent Facebook from essentially using SQL to do graph processing. So, yes, I mean, it may be a strange comparison, you know, once you kind of like just visualize it and try to partition everything. But to me, it's not, because essentially the very same things that, you know, again, like I'm saying, Facebook today is doing with Giraffe, it could have totally done with the graph database. Uh, exactly the same type of processing. Uh, Part of the reason they're not doing it is, you know, what I mentioned in, you know, some of the slides when I did the comparison, is because once you store your data in a graph database, you basically lose the uh, ability to efficiently work on that data using the tools that are available in Hadoop ecosystem. So if you want that same data to be available to your pig and your hive and your presto and your impala and your SQL on top of Hadoop, like, it's tough because it's not really stored in a central location. It's stored in a graph database. Like, you know, what do you do? Uh, so they opted out, you know, for using Giraffe, and they're pretty happy with it. But like I'm saying, if all you do is graph processing, graph databases could actually be a good choice. It's just that they do much more than just graph processing on that same data set. And, and maybe a very short question. Uh, you mentioned two times that uh, as the graph grows linearly, the number of relations grow exponentially. What do, what do you mean by that? So if you basically double the number of nodes in your graph, uh, the potential, again, not 
not the ones that you know of, but the potential number of connections grows exponentially. It grows quadratically, as far as I remember. As f no? Well, different, different types of... Uh... I, I smell some fight outside of this room, <laughs> which is good. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong or if I took this incorrectly. If I want to use a graph-based uh, data store to process and give me result sets for a real-time system, which has not uh, really low latency but low enough to be in the one millisecond or under, oh, sorry, one second or under one second range, is this a good fit or is some other graph database best suited for that? Or is this more like for batch processing and getting sort of a BI sort of information out? It's, it really is more for batch processing. I mean, there is, there is ways to get data out of the, you know, giraffe, and you can actually, like, the intermediate, you know, points of execution, you know, at certain super steps, you can actually dump, you know, the graph state. But it really is more for batch processing. Uh, there is actually an alternative now on Hadoop called Spark uh, that does, you know, full-fledged memory processing. So on Spark, they have a re-implementation of essentially, I believe, you know, the same BSP model called GraphX, I think, uh, which then you can actually inspect that model. So the whole idea of Spark is that it does computation, but it actually lets you sort of tinker with the model as you know as it computes. For the output format, are there any output formats which take uh, graphs, like which output graphs into standard graph formats which other tools can be visualized? Oh yeah, absolutely. So there's actually, <laughs> it's funny, funny, funnily enough, I mean, there is like a, a dot, uh, you know, pr pretty popular, you know, graph so visual. Gephi and everything, all other tools can sort of load these yeah, graphs and view it. Pretty much, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, you probably, again, like, you know, I'm, I'm cautious, you know, when I, like, mention dot because, you know, you don't really want to overwhelm it with, you know, like, really big graph. But if you, you know, somehow, like, I don't know, if you do any kind of clustering or whatnot and you end up with a much smaller graph, yeah, that's, that's totally fine. I mean, people do it all the time. Okay, maybe time for last question because actually we have a coffee break. So if someone prefers discussion to coffee, no, then thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.